You will always be my queen. Stab. Eh. Eh. It is okay, mighty beast. I killed Daenerys, and I accept my fate. No, John. What? You did not kill Daenerys. The dark desire for power that lives inside the heart of all of us. The need for validation, for love. You are not my true enemy. No, what really killed Daenerys is this Game of Thrones. Foolish. You are truly a wise and noble creature. Yes, and now I must take all evidence of your crime and fly back to my home planet. I should go tell Grey Worm I stabbed Daenerys in the heart. Hey, listen! So here we are, the dramatic conclusion to Game of Thrones. Fans have been waiting eagerly in anticipation for... I'm just kidding. Immediately after the Game of Thrones series finale, a friend of mine sent me a text that said, That episode was straight filler. LOL. And it seems like most other people also found the Game of Thrones series finale... boring. It might have been nice for some to see the Stark kids go off into different life paths, and Peter Dinklage acted the hell out of his scenes. However, the rest of the episode felt... dull like the air slowly being deflated out of a balloon. Now obviously, some of this has to do with the poor choices D&D made throughout the season. And as Mahler has shown in a video, 57 minutes of the series finale of Game of Thrones contains no dialogue. That means about 73% of the entire episode is just shots of people looking at things. But beyond that, this specific episode was structured incorrectly, and is a perfect example of one of the biggest problems plaguing Game of Thrones in the later seasons. And that's conflict. Conflict and drama is the central part of any story, whether it be saving the universe, finding love, forgetting love, finally getting power and validation, taking your kingdom back from your treacherous uncle. All stories are about how characters deal with conflict. Do they overcome it and succeed, or do they fail? And how? As soon as cavemen could paint on walls, stories had conflict. This fundamental aspect of storytelling is completely mishandled by D&D. Going into the series finale, there was three main conflicts the audience expected to see. Number one, does Daenerys have any internal conflict about destroying King's Landing? Number two, what will Jon and Tyrion's reaction be? Will they betray Daenerys? And how? And three, who will sit on the Iron Throne and rule Westeros? So let's dig in. Number one, does Danny have any internal conflict about destroying King's Landing? <laughs> oh wait, you serious? Let me laugh even harder. <laughs> no, the answer is no. Danny's gone full blown. Evil. So we can just throw that conflict opportunity right into the trash. Why did D&D decide to go this easy and boring route? Because the key conflict for most of the episode is almost entirely on John. Which leads us to number two, John and Tyrion. Tyrion's reaction and resolution to the conflict with Danny is all fine, completely makes sense, and was handled as well as it could be. So we're not gonna talk about that. Ha! Got him! Let's talk about John. Now, D&D start this in a bad place, since they focus the first half of the episode's conflict almost exclusively on the question of, will John turn against Danny? A kind of stupid question, as no living, breathing human being who's ever watched Game of Thrones would possibly think John would be okay with Danny burning an entire city to the ground for no reason. Thus, half the episode being dedicated to rubbing in our faces that Daenerys is... <coughs> 
is utterly pointless, as everyone knows John will turn against her. And we're further bored, or even a little insulted, by the show pretending like John just needs some more convincing than the smoldering bodies of innocent men, women, and children. The conflict needed to be focused not on whether John would betray Danny, but how he would, and what would be the consequences of such betrayal. Lingering on this fake will he, won't he question is a terrible idea. So let's go through the episode. Conflict starts right off the bat when John finds Grey Worm executing surrendered Lannister soldiers. John is like, WCF, mate. And Grey Worm is like, Kill them all. Neither backs down. Soldiers draw their weapons, conflict ensues. Davo says, let's see the queen about this. Originally I thought, oh, okay, that's a good idea. Assuming he meant that John and Grey Worm will both go talk to Daenerys together about the fate of the prisoners. However, that's apparently not what Davos meant. Him and John just walk away and Grey Worm is free to kill the prisoners. Wait, what? Yeah, what? Now, despite this being horribly out of character for John, we're not gonna focus on character, we're not gonna focus on character, it's the standard example of how D&D deal with conflict this season. A problem is presented, conflict builds, tension achieved, and then conflict resolves instantly in an unsatisfying way that sacrifices character, themes, and story. Tension deflates. <laughs> So that's one conflict already resolved poorly. Next, John slowly walks to go find Daenerys. I guess he's not worried about the wholesale slaughter of prisoners anymore. If our characters don't care, then obviously we the audience won't care either. However, John is required to walk slow so we can see all these visuals that remind us that Danny is totally Character and tension is once again sacrificed at the altar of cool visuals. John finds Danny apparently throwing herself a fascist Star Wars First Order victory parade. D&D are really well known for their subtle storytelling. Then we see that Danny's entire army of eunuchs somehow repopulated themselves off screen. I can only assume Daenerys flew her dragon to Kamino to pick up more clone troopers. Very impressive. Then we find that Grey Worm has apparently teleported to Daenerys first. Now, John is visibly confused by this. However, he doesn't bring it up, possibly embarrassed because he fell asleep during the last war meeting while Danny was handing out jetpacks and doesn't want to bring it up. Then we are treated to the greatest visual and cinematic history. D&D are known for their subtlety. Next, Daenerys gives the quintessential evil dictator, we're taking over the world, I'm totally a bad guy even though I think I'm a good guy, speech. They even give what I call the despot's angle. What is this, Soviet Russia? A anyways, we learn that Daenerys is not only not upset about committing genocide, she's planning on continuing her war against the whole world. What the heck are you talking about? Wait, does that mean she's not gonna sit on the Iron Throne? So who's gonna rule Westeros? Is she planning on attacking the ideology of feudalism itself? Is she going full communist revolution? We don't know because the show doesn't tell us, because the writers don't care. There is only one point to this entire speech, to make it even easier for Jon to kill Daenerys, which is pretty stupid when that's the main conflict D&D decided to focus their series finale on. Next, when Danny and Jon lock eyes, things don't look good for him. Jon looks at her unsure and afraid. Danny looks at Jon with contempt, even disgust. She even does the, you're so beneath me, I have better things to do, I roll. Destroy! This is all good. For conflict and tension, that is. Danny seems pretty over John. Now the conflict is more complicated. Even if John decides to betray and possibly kill Daenerys, with her being suspicious of him, how will he be able to do it? Next, John visits Tyrion in his jail cell. Tyrion is being guarded by a bunch of Unsullied. This will come up later. There, they have an argument about whether Jon should support Daenerys. In theory, this would be good, as you'd want your characters to argue about a complicated moral conflict and give both sides of the issue. Unfortunately, however, D&D's simplistic choice of Danny going full genocide makes the whole conversation actually stupid, as no sane person, especially a goody two-shoes like Jon, could possibly even conceive of supporting Daenerys. Daenerys was right King's Landing had to burn West Eros would have been better off with her on the Iron Throne, by Matthew Iglesias a very serious person with very serious political opinions. 
I said sane person! SANE PERSON! So this attempt to heighten the conflict and tension feels fake and forced. Because it is. I mean, even during the conversation, Tyrion gives Jon the are you fucking kidding me face. That being said, Peter Dinklage's acting is once again top notch, so it does kind of save the scene, even though it's ultimately pointless. Anyways, Jon leaves to find Drogon sleeping under rubble. Yes, not just ash, but rubble. That don't make no sense. Then we find the Iron Throne is the one thing not destroyed in the Red Keep, because of course it is. Where even though minutes earlier Danny was talking about not caring about the Iron Throne and instead wanted to engage on a worldwide campaign, she now stares at the Iron Throne with what can only be described as sexual excitement. Then John appears. Danny turns and looks at him in delight? Uh What's going on? Here. Despite a few minutes earlier, Dan looking at John in complete disgust, she's now happy to see him, and is totally in love with him all over again. Wow, I guess looking at that chair really did get her excited. Sploosh. Also note that while Tyrion had a row of guards watching him for some reason, Daenerys, the queen, has exactly no guards. Yeah, Drogon was out front, but she is setting foot for the first time in an enemy castle. You know, there could still be some angry people hiding inside. But of course, the reason there are no guards is the same reason Danny loves and trusts Jon again so he can easily stab her. Heartwarming. This is how D&D deal with conflict. They build it up, they then create a bunch of contrived situations and feelings, all to resolve the conflict as quickly and easily as possible. It's like a roller coaster that spends five minutes going up, only to drop two feet and immediately stop at a gift shop. Kinda missing the whole point here, D&D. You're not gonna chat up a girl for two hours in a bar just to take her home, throw a glass of water at her, slap her in the face, and then tell her to leave. Be gone, fuck! Half the episode is dedicated to a conflict we already know the outcome of. While well, the answer to the conflict of how he will turn on her, something the audience doesn't know, is completely rushed and glossed over. The focus on the episode should have been on the how, not the why. Something that could have been a complicated issue. Because not only could it have been physically difficult for Jon to get close enough to kill a distrusting Danny in the first place, but there's three huge problems with just stabbing Danny. Three huge problems the show barely addresses. The Dothraki, Unsullied, and Drogon. On. The Dothraki are a band of murdering, pillaging barbarians who would have absolutely no qualms about indiscriminately attacking every city and castle in Westeros. Do you remember what happens to the Dothraki after Danny dies? You know why you don't remember? Because nothing happens. The show doesn't show you what happens to the Dothraki. They're just not mentioned. In D&D hope you didn't notice. Hey, isn't that the guy who murdered our Khaleesi? Shouldn't we like, kill him? Nah, that would cause too much political instability. You have to respect the process. For all we know, while all these Stark kids are going off on fun adventures, the Dothraki are running around pillaging innocent Westerosi cities. I'm glad it had a happy ending after all. Me too. Next we have the Unsullied, which is supposed to be one of the best armies in the entire world, and worship Daenerys as their own personal Jesus. In case you forgot, as apparently D&D did, the entire point of creating an army of male eunuchs who will be physically weaker than normal men since they didn't go through puberty is to create soldiers whose greatest strength is their loyalty, obedience, and discipline. The Unsullied are conditioned from birth to unquestioningly follow their master. That's their entire purpose. And they're led by Grey Worm, a man who's shown to deal with grief and loss by lashing out at anyone he can in a bloodlust. In two days' time, Grey Worm has lost the woman he loves and the woman he worships. It seems like a pretty dangerous combination. There is absolutely no conceivable reason that they would not immediately kill John. It doesn't matter if it meant they would all die, they would still do it. Based on what we know, we could probably expect them to mindlessly go forth into the world, trying to bring about Danny's last vision until they all died. And since Danny didn't clearly explain her vision, Grey Worm's interpretation would be based on her actions. I could foresee the Unsullied ruthlessly traveling the world and killing anyone in the upper class, like a roving band of communist enforcers. Now, despite the fact that Danny specifically mentions Westerosi cities that need saving, 
the Unsullied decide to just leave Westeros for no reason other than that it easily and quickly resolves a potential interesting and difficult conflict. Well, isn't that convenient for you? And the potential John Unsullied conflict is handled in an even more ridiculous way. After not killing John for no reason, a bunch of John's family members and friends decide his fate and the fate of all Westeros. And the Unsullied accept this because... I don't imagine thinking about that subject will leave you any happier than before. Sansa is like, You better let John go. We have a tiny army of all the tired Northmen who didn't die. Grey Worm is like, We will kill them all. And then silly old Davos says, Hey, why don't you guys just start your own house? Yes, that's right. Davos suggested to the group of men who lack the ability to reproduce that they should start their own house lineage. To which Grey Worm rightfully responds, Bitch, are you for real? Then after laughably choosing Bran as king, and yes, We'll get to that, they come up with a mind-numbing plan of how to deal with John. John will be banished to the Night's Watch. So despite the Night's Watch's primary purpose of stopping White Walkers and Wildlings no longer being necessary, they still exist. Because, as Tyrion says, they will always need a place to exile people. Okay, that does make sense within the Game of Thrones world and honestly isn't bad reasoning. However, there are two gigantic problems with this. The first being that Bran just gave away the North to Sansa. That means that Bran would have no authority to exile anyone to the Night's Watch, thus defeating the entire purpose of the new Night's Watch existence as a place to send exiled people. And second, John is still the damn King of the North! Did everyone just forget? This would be like if the US tried to banish Justin Trudeau to the deepest, darkest recesses of Canada. Quebec. Hey, fuck you, buddy. John could take one step into the north and be like, Oh, hey, I'm still king. I unbanish myself. Nice. I guess John is just too honorable to do that after his sister stole his crown, despite John being voted king by the Northern Lords and Sansa not being. Hey, maybe Sansa, accepting John's banishment despite the Unsullied immediately leaving so it's not like they would know, isn't a plot hole. Maybe it's how she's seizing power. Anyways, I guess John isn't so honorable that he stays at the Night's Watch as he immediately leaves the castle in order to go hang out with the wildlings, who also for no reason other than to avoid conflict have decided to live in the freezing tundra. With those potentially interesting conflicts safely removed from our story, that leaves us with a big old dragon. How does D&D deal with a potentially angry, wild, city-destroying beast? Well, obviously, he gains the intelligence required to understand what the Iron Throne represents and how it affected Daenerys' downfall, doesn't kill Jon for no reason, and then flies away with Danny's body. Oh, well, isn't that convenient? And no, it has nothing to do with Jon's Targaryen blood. Not only does the show never establish that dragons won't harm Targaryens, but the book explicitly says the opposite. There was kind of this big Targaryen civil war called the Dance of the Dragons, which shaped the entire history of Westeros, where all the Targaryens killed each other. The Game of Thrones Blu-ray even has an animated version of this narrated by the cast. So when it comes to the potential conflicts between Danny and Jon, D&D picked the one we saw coming from a mile away and just conveniently wash all the other conflicts away with nonsensical reasons. Which has us with only one final conflict to deal with. Number three, who will sit on the Iron Throne? Yes, who will win the titular Game of Thrones? A question that has been with us since the beginning. So much like the White Walkers, we can only assume it will end in a terribly unsatisfying way. Yes, with almost no conflict whatsoever, Tyrion, for the worst reason on the planet, proclaims Bran should be king. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Nothing can stop it. And who has a better story? than Bran the Broken. Wait! That doesn't even make any sense! Even Elizabeth Warren knew that was BS. Bran is like the least engaged of all the people there, and we had all this great character 
development and he's kind of like the one who's never been a part of any part of it. Now talking about who has an actual better story is pointless because this reasoning that Tyrion gives is fake. You liar! There's only two reasons D&D would make Bran king. The first is because they cut out or changed all the stuff with the Children of the Forest and the Three-Eyed Raven possibly being evil, like in the books, and the Azor High prophecy, it would mean that everything that Bran's done for five seasons, journeying to the Three-Eyed Raven, learning to use his powers, time travel, all of it would have been completely and utterly pointless unless Bran became king. The only effect Bran had on the entire story up until this point is that he tells Jon about his parents. And even that is completely unnecessary because Sam finds that information out on his own. So Bran being selected as king is purely an attempt by D&D to fix a massive plot hole they made. Yes, D&D sacrificed the conflict that the title of the show is based off of in the series finale of their show to fix a plot hole. Oopsie. Well, either that or George R.R. R. Martin told them Bran would end up being king in the books, and D&D was just too lazy or dumb to set it up properly. One or the other. And that's why everyone just magically agrees that Bran, the completely emotionless weirdo detached from feelings and reality who can sort through all of time and space, should be king. That's all you forgot to say. Thank you. Thank you. For helping me. My brother died for you. Hodor and Summer died for you. I almost died for you. Brian. I'm not really. Not anymore. I remember what it felt like to be Brandon Stark. But I remember so much else now. You died in that cave. You are correct, sir! It would be like making Dr. Manhattan King. He would either do absolutely nothing because he couldn't care less, or he would completely screw everything up as an experiment just out of curiosity. King Bran, the town of Innocent Peoplesville, is being brutally attacked by the remnants of Daenerys' Dothraki horde. Shall we send aid? No. No? Tyrion, I have foreseen this event, therefore it is destiny. Everything is as it should be. I regret recommending you as king. I knew you would. Bran even implies in the episode that he knew everything would go down the way it did and didn't try to change it so that he would be king. But everyone just accepts Bran instantly. Boy, that escalated quickly. Then Sansa gets very mad about it and declares the North will remain independent under her rule. That doesn't make any goddamn sense! Because the whole point of the North declaring independence was because they wanted a northern Stark ruler. We know no king, but the king in the North whose name is Stark. Ned Stark's blood runs through his veins. He's my king from this day until his last day. Now Bran is also obviously of Stark blood. So... What are you doing? To which Sansa says... Tens of thousands of Northmen fell in the Great War defending all of Westeros. And those who survived have seen too much and fought too hard ever to kneel again. Oh, kneeling. She doesn't want the North to ever have to bow to a feudal lord again. Twelve seconds later. I guess since D&D ruined Daenerys, they just had to throw some kind of bone to the strong, independent female crowd. Even if it doesn't make sense, it actually makes the characters seem worse. We were getting so close to having this ending with just women running the world. Exactly! And, and the then the last two crazy. episodes, and, right. it's like, oh, they're too emotional. Yeah, exactly. Can't do the that. The end. It's like, oh, this was written I, by so men. So I was even willing at the end to make a quick allegiance shift. I was over to Sansa. 
Yes. I was like, Team yes. Santa, I will redo my shirts. Totally. The whole thing. Now, some of you may be saying, But wait a second, Sitch. The writers couldn't have resolved all the conflicts you mentioned. It was the final episode. That's true, and I'm not saying any of these conflicts should have been resolved in the finale. All these conflicts should have been brought up, shown, and then not resolved. Rather left open-ended as big problems the characters would have to deal with in the future. This is the perfect example of D&D's failed handling of conflict ever since they ran out of book material. In the first few seasons, conflict and violence in Game of Thrones almost always led to more conflict and more violence. John Aaron, who knew the truth about Jaime and Cersei being killed, is what sets the entire show in motion. The attempt on Bran's life is what gets Kat to kidnap Tyrion, which gets Jaime to attack Ned, which delays Ned from leaving King's Landing, which ends with Ned getting killed. Ned's execution only leads to more war. King Robert ordering Daenerys to be killed is what motivates Khal Drogo to even come to Westeros in the first place. Stannis killing his brother leads to the Tyrells joining with the Lannisters, which only makes things worse for Stannis. Theon betraying the Starks is what leads to all the bad things that happened to him with Ramsay. And of course, the killing of Rob and Cat lead to all of the Freys being wiped out. Even Joffrey's death by the Tyrells starts the chain of events that cause all the Tyrells to be wiped out as well. Heck, the Children of the Forest created the White Walkers as a weapon to defeat humans, and it only backfired on them. In the early show, when characters tried to solve their problems with violence, it almost always came back to hurt them. In the books, it's very clear that there is this anti-war, anti-violence message, as all the conflict and quest for revenge only creates new conflict and more violence. It never ends. That's why I call D&D's fake war is bad message in the second to last episode complete BS. Because as soon as they ran out of book material, D&D started using violence and murder to end conflicts, not create new ones. Arya kills all the Freys, and that's it. Nothing bad comes of it. Nothing comes of it at all. They're just dead. Revenge complete. The Sand Snakes kill the leaders of Dorne, and no one cares. All the Dornists are just like, whatever, I guess. Cersei kills most of her Tyrell and Sparrow enemies by blowing up the holiest church in Westeros. And that's it. Nothing bad comes out of it. She just succeeds in killing her enemies. Problem solved. Danny just kills all the bad guy slavers and harpies. Problem solved. John kills all the people who betrayed him, including a small orphan child who watched his own parents be murdered. Problem solved. Ramsay is killed by being eaten alive by dogs. Problem solved. And even the Night King, they just kill him and that's it! The White Walkers are all just gone forever! It's over! Remember when the people who defended Danny going crazy said we should have expected it because Game of Thrones isn't gonna have a happy fairy tale ending? Except it kinda did. All the Stark kids seem pretty happy with the outcome. And the final scene of the small council figuring out how to restore peace in the kingdom after years of war is just a joke scene about brothels. Now D&D could have still had their dumb ending, but if they kept with the themes of the book and the early show, instead of tying everything up in a neat little bow, it would have at least made the last episode a lot more interesting and not feel so boring and forced. Sure, have the Council of Stark family and friends vote Bran King, even grant independence to the North, but this should only cause more problems, not less. Now the Iron Islanders and the Dornish demand independence too. Is Bran going to give it to them, or will there be more war? Meanwhile, the Dothraki are running around pillaging any city they come across, while the Unsullied are killing off all the lords they can. And Drogon is flying around causing random havoc. Then in the north, the wildlings don't go back to the frozen tundra for no reason, but decide to live off the land in the north they were promised by Jon and Stannis. The wildlings refuse to bow to Sansa, and are also pouring into other northern lord lands. This angers the northern lords, who demand their new queen do something about it, all while they're grumbling under their breath that they wanted Jon to rule. Ruling isn't about winning a game. It's not about just being able to tell everyone what to do. 
That's what children think. She is no longer yours to torment. Everyone is mine to torment. I am the king! I will punish you. Any man who must say, I am the king, is no true king. The king is tired. See him to his chambers. Come along. I'm not tired. Ruling is about being responsible for thousands of people's well-being. I guess D&D &D forgot what old Ned Stark once said to Rob. He once told me that being a lord is like being a father. Except you have thousands of children. And you worry about all of them. Farmers plowing fields are yours to protect. The charwomen scrubbing the floors are yours to protect. The soldiers you order into battle. He told me he woke with fear in the morning and went to bed with fear in the night. I asked him, how can a man be brave if he's afraid? That is the only time a man can be brave, he told me. So no, Game of Thrones did end with a nice, happy fairy tale. The good guys all lived happily ever after ending. Just not for Daenerys.